one. Good afternoon. I'm Gordon Dixon, Executive Vice President for the Virginia Transportation Construction Alliance, and welcome to another in our series of the members VTCA membership only webinars to help you navigate through the challenges in your business. We have an interesting topic today and joining us is is Ann Bebo from Van Veter and Black uh, talking to us about weed on the job site. Uh, many of you all know this past uh, spring, the General Assembly uh, made uh, marijuana legal effective July 1st, 2021. The vote makes Virginia the 16th state to legalize the drug and the first in the South to take this step, though retail sales won't begin until January 1st, 2024. There are all kinds of rules and regulations in this, and it gets a little confusing because this is a fairly complex discussion on this. It's going to take several years to go through, uh, and some of this, quite frankly, is rather ambiguous. Uh, so without further ado, I give you Ann Bebo to talk to us about the uh, the discussion. Ann, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gordon, and thank you to the VTCA for having me speak. I'm excited to address your membership about this um, topic. If you can go to the next slide, please. This is just a standard disclaimer that this presentation isn't legal advice. Next slide, please. Um, just a reminder, this presentation is being recorded and we will provide a copy of the recording and the slides to everyone who registered by email when the presentation is over. During the presentation, you're welcome to submit questions and I'm hoping at the end that we'll have some time for me to go through your questions, um, but I will leave them to the end because I'm not so good at talking and reading the questions at the same time. Um, if you go to the top of your screen, there's a little bubble with a question mark in it. And if you click on that, you can type in your question. And like I said, at the end, I'll try to get through as many of those as I can. And you're also welcome to visit our firm's website, um, vanblacklaw.com, um, to see if there's some ways that we can help your business. Next slide, please. Here are the topics I'm going to cover in this presentation. Of course, first, I'm going to start out with explaining what's going on with weed in Virginia, what our laws are now saying, what they're going to say. I'm also going to talk about the federal law and also about federal safety regulations for those that, of you that are subject to MSHA, OSHA, DOT regulations. I'm going to touch on all of those and the conflict between them and the Virginia law. And then I'm going to have just some general considerations and explain um, the thought process or the analysis that you as employers should go through when you're dealing with questions about employees who um, have THC in their system. Next slide, please. So this is, I'm going to give a brief overview of Virginia's um, history with weed, and I'm going to kind of go through some of this quickly because I just want to give you a little background, then I'll get to what's going on now. So back in 2015, Virginia took its first step into this area by allowing the use and possession of CBD oil or THCA oil to treat intractable epilepsy, and it was only for that one medical condition, not for anything else. And then... In 26 and in 2016 and 2017, Virginia authorized the establishment of five pharmaceutical processors to, pro to produce and dispense these oils. And there's one per health service. And this is a, the pharmaceutical processors are uh, an integrated vertical um, facility where they grow, extract, dispense, and deliver the cannabis oils all on site. So it's, it's one unit. Next slide, please. So there are five of these um, pharmaceutical processors. We, the um, one in Stanton is vacant and the others are filled and I have the names of the businesses there. Next slide, please. Then in 2018, Virginia expanded the medical cannabis oil program to any diagnosed condition upon a written certification from a physician. And then that was later expanded in 2019 to allow nurse practitioners and phys physician assistants to write those written certifications. Importantly, and I may slip up on this a few times during the presentation, these are not prescriptions. Um, there's a technical definition of a medical prescription and it has to be for something that's legal. And as you all know, marijuana is still illegal under federal law. So technically a doctor cannot write a prescription for anything with marijuana, but they can um, write a written certification under this Virginia law for these um, oils. 
They've also expanded the spectrum of products that can be available for treatment to include capsules, topicals, lozenges, lollipops, and suppositories. Next slide, please. In 2020, they expanded it a bit further to allow um, the patient, parent, legal guardian, or registered agent of the patient to legally possess the cannabis oils. Again, it all has to be pursuant to a valid written certification from a healthcare practitioner. They have to be registered with the Board of Pharmacy. So there's some, some very strict rules on how this very limited medical um, marijuana program will work in Virginia or does work in Virginia. And then in July 2021, they can start producing and selling products other than oils. Next slide, please. Last year in 2020, effective July 1st, 2020, Virginia decriminalized simple possession. Simple possession is defined as having um, no more than one ounce of marijuana and without intent to distribute. So there can't be some other evidence that the person was intending to sell it or otherwise distribute it. But someone who's possessing um, one ounce or less for personal use, there's now a rebuttable, rebuttable presumption that they just have it for, for personal use. It's not um, a crime. It's currently, and I say current because we only have about a month, maybe five weeks left of this, um, currently just a civil offense with a $25 penalty. At the same time last year, the General Assembly passed a law that prohibits employers from requiring applicants or employees to disclose any charges, arrests, or convictions for simple possession. So that's an important thing to know. You should update your employment application, make sure whoever's doing the recruiting for your company knows. Don't ask questions about um, past charges, arrests, or convictions for simple possession, because just asking that question is impermissible. Next slide, please. So now we've jumped quickly from decriminalization to just one year later, we are um, staring down the barrel of legalization. Um, there are a lot of complexities to this law, as Gordon mentioned. It's um, a staggered implementation. It doesn't all go into effect at once. And certain provisions of this legislation have to be reenacted next year or else they don't go into effect. Um, one provision they pushed through to have made effective this July, and as Gordon mentioned, this means that starting July 1, people age 21 and older in Virginia can legally possess up to one ounce of marijuana, again, as long as they don't have the intent to distribute. You're also allowed to have home cultivation of up to four marijuana plants per household, provided that the plants are labeled with a tag that has identifying information and a notation that the plant is being grown for personal use as authorized. The plants have to be um, not visible from the public street, from the road, the public way. And you have to take precautions to prevent unauthorized access by those younger than 21. So Junior has to know this is mommy's weed. He's not allowed to play with it. Um, what's really funny to me about this, this um, rapid legalization that goes into effect on July 1 is you still can't sell marijuana legally in Virginia. So there's no legal way for anyone to actually acquire marijuana starting in July in Virginia. You can't go buy it in DC and drive back to the Commonwealth because that would be transporting it across state lines and that would be a crime. You can't buy the seeds online because again, that's transporting across state lines. So the only way you're gonna get these plants or the less than one ounce of smokable marijuana in your possession is if magical fairies gift you with this. That's what the legislature has written. So they're basically allowing you to have it, but there's no legal way for you to get it. But if magical fairies happen to deliver marijuana plants to your house or weed to your house, you're welcome to enjoy it, provided you stay within these rules. Next slide, please. Some other aspects of this law, and again, a lot of this has to be reenacted in order for it to go into effect, but they're establishing a bunch of new um, agencies and funds. One is the Virginia Cannabis Control Authority, which some people have likened to the ABC, but there's an important distinction here. So once all this goes into effect in 2024, assuming everything's reenacted, you will still have to go to an ABC store to buy Jack Daniels, but you'll be able to buy a joint down at the corner store, um, at the you know the retail shop, which is pretty remarkable that we'll have tougher rules for alcohol than we will for marijuana, but that's the way they've written it. 
So there will be the Virginia Cannabis Control Authority. There's a new a Cannabis Oversight Commission that will oversee the VCCA. There's going to be a Cannabis Equity Reinvestment Board. A lot of this law is aimed at what they call equity, which is trying to undo some of the social harms that have been caused by unequal enforcement of marijuana laws to date. So there's going to be a Cannabis Equity Reinvestment Board which will administer the Cannabis Equity Reinvestment Fund, which will basically make funding available to certain people who meet certain criteria, um, basically socially disadvantaged groups that have been historically disadvantaged by marijuana enforcement laws. There's going to be a Virginia Cannabis Equity Loan Fund. Um, there, there's also an expungement process for certain marijuana-related offenses. Um, as we mentioned, Consumer retail sales will begin um, January 1st of 2024 if that law is reenacted. Local um, municipalities, cities, and towns can have a um, referendum to prohibit retail marijuana stores in their jurisdiction. They can also impose restrictions on sales. Most importantly, from the Commonwealth perspective, they are going to tax the hell out of this stuff. The tax rates that they have proposed for marijuana are really high. So although a lot of people are eager to jump into that industry and make a fortune, um, the reality is the government's going to take a big bite out of that fortune. Um, I think the tax rate is like 21 um, percent. It's, it's very high. Uh, they have also modified some of the criminal, some of the other criminal penalties related to marijuana. There is a public public awareness campaign on health and safety risks, and there's going to be additional training for law enforcement. Next slide, please. Now, all that's good and well, but as we all know, federal law still makes marijuana illegal, and that's because of the Controlled Substance Act of 1970, and that's the law that um, regulates the manufacture, importation, possession, use, and distribution of certain substances. And the act places all regulated substances into one of five schedules based on basically how bad is this drug, um, how, whether the drug has an accepted medical use, the potential for abuse, and safety and potential for addiction. So all those criteria go into sorting out which schedule, which category, basically, a particular drug fits into. Next slide, please. And so under that law, Schedule 1 is the worst. These are the, the worst of the worst. These are the worst drugs. Um, these are drugs that have um, a high potential for abuse, no currently accepted medical use and treatment in the United States, and there's a lack of accepted safety for use of the drug or substance under me medical supervision. And the drugs that are under that category are heroin, LSD, and marijuana, and, and some others. But I think most people, even those who oppose legalization, would agree that marijuana really shouldn't be in Schedule 1. It doesn't really have, it doesn't fit any of those um, criteria, but that's where it is right now. It's lumped in with heroin and LSD. Next slide, please. So because of this, there's a huge conflict between the federal law and the state law. And we've seen a lot of this play out in the Western states that um, were pioneers in legalizing marijuana. So several years ago, the Justice Department issued a series of memoranda that were called the Cole Memos that basically said, we're going to take a hands-off approach to marijuana in states where it's legal, with a few exceptions. And they have what they call their enforcement priorities with regard to marijuana. So regardless of whether it's legal in the state or not, they'll take action if it's being sold to minors. They'll take action if it's being sold as part of a criminal enterprise. Things like that. They have this list of enforcement priorities. But otherwise, if you're selling and using marijuana consistently with state law, the Justice Department, um, meaning the FBI, they're not going to take any enforcement action. They're going to basically leave you alone. Um, Attorney General Sessions, under the Trump administration, didn't like that. He rescinded the Cole memos. But nonetheless, the Justice Department has continued to apply this policy that we're just not going to mess with it. If the state allows it and you're obeying state law, you're fine. That's all good and well, but if you are a business, you might need banking. Um, you might need loans from the SBA. Um, if your employees might occasionally need to file bankruptcy. All those federal laws have real clear prohibitions on anything derived from a controlled substance. So there have been some wacky results. For example, there was um, there have been several bankruptcy cases 
in which individuals have been denied bankruptcy protection because they worked for a business that derived income from cannabis. So for example, there was a woman who worked as a, a low-level data entry employee for a temporary staffing firm that provided temp labor to a number of businesses, including a marijuana business. And this employee, this is a W-2 wage earner, filed for bankruptcy protection, and her case was dismissed. She was denied bankruptcy protection because she derived income, however indirectly, from the cannabis industry. And that's been how courts have been looking at this. So with banking, there is a requirement that banks report suspicious activity, which would include um, activity related to illegal things like marijuana. So that makes banking very difficult for marijuana businesses. Um, you can't get an SBA loan if you derive money from a marijuana business. So there are all these problems that the conflict between federal and state law have created for businesses. Next slide, please. As a result, there have been a lot of um, efforts in Congress to fix this. The most recent and the one that looks like it might possibly succeed is the MORE Act. Marijuana, and Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act. And that would remove cannabis from the list of scheduled substances under the Controlled Substance Act. It would decriminalize the manufacture, distribution, and possession. It would create an opportunity trust fund. It would impose taxes. Of course, I can get the government to legalize, tell them this is another revenue source. Um, it would create a community investment program. Its status is in December, it passed the House and it's now sitting in the Senate. So we're just waiting to see what the Senate will do with it. Um, it's, I've read some articles where people are predicting it will pass. It, has, it does have bipartisan support. That's kind of the interesting thing about marijuana. Um, there are a lot of people on both sides of the aisle that favor legalization. That doesn't mean it's actually gonna go through, but um, a lot of people have optimism about this. Next slide, please. So now just to talk a little bit about the FDA. As I'm sure you're aware, there are a ton of products out there right now that have CBD in them, and it's illegal still to market any product containing CBD, whether it's from hemp or marijuana, as having a therapeutic benefit or as a dietary supplement unless the FDA has reviewed and approved it. And they really haven't done that. So um, with very few exceptions I have, limit, I have listed there, um, they, they only approve drugs after determining that it's safe and effective for intended use. So uh, there have been a lot of problems with companies marketing products um, that are supposed to cure various things or do various things for your body or that you're supposed to add to your food that contains CBD that really is not legal to market the way that's being marketed. Next slide, please. But basically, the FDA has been overwhelmed. As, as you all know, CBD is everywhere. Um, just about any store carries something with CBD in it now. You see CBD stores popping up all over the place. Um, the problem is there's no standard for this stuff. So the fact that something has CBD on the label doesn't mean it even contains CBD. And if it does contain CBD, there is no guarantee as to what type of CBD is in there, how strong the CBD is, whether it has THC or not, and if so, how much. Um, the FDA has tested some of the products. Again, I think they're just overwhelmed with the volume that's out there. And they found that many of the products um, did not contain the levels of CBD claimed. Virginia does permit hemp-derived extracts intended for human consumption as an approved food ingredient or dietary supplement if the manufacturer follows certain Virginia food safety guidelines. But as I said, the FDA takes a different approach. Um, just as a note so that you're aware, CBD can be derived from either hemp or marijuana. Hemp and marijuana are really the same plant, and they differ only in the amount of THC. Um, it's pretty common for a hemp plant to become marijuana. They, that's what they call going hot. The, the field goes hot when you plant a field of hemp, and it tests with a higher level of THC than hemp is supposed to contain. It's gone hot. Um, so the difference between the two is, is razor thin. So you can have CBD derived from hemp that actually contains THC. So you would expect to not have C, um, you would expect not to have THC if the CBD was derived from hemp, but it can happen. And CBD derived from marijuana, you would expect to have some THC even if the manufacturer is telling you it doesn't. Next slide, please. 
So what does THC do? We all, we've all seen the Cheech and Chong films, or maybe that's just people of a certain age remember Cheech and Chong. But we've all seen things in the pop culture, and you probably have experienced some things personally. But basically, just to kind of go over for those of you who aren't familiar with how THC works, it's stored in the fatty tissues in the body, and it's released over a period of time for hours, from hours to weeks. And that all depends on the person's individual body, um, his or her metabolism. It depends on the strain of the marijuana. All those and a whole bunch of other factors will affect um, how long the person's going to be impaired and how, how impaired the person will be. So we don't have real bright line rules with marijuana like we do with alcohol. With alcohol, we can say a blood alcohol content of X or higher, you're drunk. And so we have laws that are very clear on that. If you're caught driving with a BAC above a certain point, then you can be convicted. Otherwise, you're just a little tipsy, but you're probably going to be okay. Well, we don't have that with marijuana because it's very individual depending on the person. Um, the impairment can affect the cognitive and physical functions of the person, short-term memory, the ability to process and analyze information, the ability to concentrate. It can delay people's reaction time. It can alter their sensory perception. Next slide, please. So those are all reasons why you don't want someone who's impaired on the job site. So I'm sure you're all well aware. Um, most businesses do drug testing of some sort. If you're not doing drug testing, that might be a problem for you because that's probably where the druggies are going to get their jobs um, because most businesses do do some type of drug testing at this point, um, either as pre-employment drug testing or random drug testing or reasonable suspicion drug testing or post-accident. Well, most drug testing will reveal THC. It's not going to reveal CBD. And as I mentioned, even some CBD can contain THC. But there are some drug tests that don't distinguish between the two different types of cannabinoids. Um, so that might be an issue. You might need to look into what type of drug testing you're actually doing. You know, get with your tester, to testing provider to find out what, how they're doing the test, what are they testing for. But as a general rule, testing will show whether the individual has consumed THC within the last several weeks. It's not going to tell you whether the individual is currently impaired. You really have to have a toxicologist um, review the uh, test. It's got to reveal the precise amount of um, THC in the person's body. And most drug testing isn't going to give you such precise results. It's usually just going to show whether they're positive or negative for THC but it's certainly not going to reveal if they're impaired, even if it does reveal the amount of THC that's not going to necessarily tell you whether the person's impaired, and certainly not to the point where you can draw a bright line and say a THC above a certain level would equal impairment. Next slide, please. So Virginia has just recently, this is in April, passed a law, and it got very little publicity. It kind of went under the radar with a sneak law. Um, where they created some employment protections for uh, marijuana usage in a very, very restricted, limited capacity. So under this law, employers are prohibited from discharging, disciplining, or discriminating against an employee for the employee's lawful use of cannabis oil pursuant to a valid written certification by a practitioner for a diagnosed condition or disease. So this is really designed for those um, individuals in Virginia who are going to the pharmaceutical processors that I talked about early in the presentation. They have a written certification from a practitioner that they need cannabis oil for a diagnosed condition or disease. So that's, those are the only people who are going to be protected by this law. Those people are protected if they're just possessing the oil or if I'm sorry, if they're just using the oil but they are still not allowed to be impaired at work. And as I mentioned, that's gonna be a big question mark if they're impaired or not. And you as the employer can still prohibit them from possessing the oil during work hours. Now, the law also has an exception that employers are not required to commit any act that would cause the employer to be in violation of federal law, or that would result in the loss of federal contracting or funding, or would require any defense industrial-based sector employer to hire or retain employees who test positive for THC in excess of 50 nanograms per milliliter for a urine test or 10 pictograms per milligram or microgram for a hair test. 
Next slide, please. Now, because that law just came out, as I said, last month, we have yet to see how courts are going to interpret it. I have a lot of questions about how that's going to play out practically. But for now, we're just kind of taking educated guesses. One law that we do know a lot about that comes into play with the whole marijuana in the workplace issue is the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act. It applies to employers with 15 or more employees, but there is a state law equivalent under the Virginia Human Rights Act that's very similar. So everything I'm talking about with the ADA is very similar to the Virginia law if you're a smaller business, because the Virginia law applies to smaller businesses, businesses with less than 15 employees. So the ADA prohibits employment decisions that are based on a disability. Um, it requires employers to provide a reasonable accommodation to an employee or applicant's disability, unless the accommodation would create an undue burden for the employer. And there is an exception if the disabled individual poses a direct threat to the health and safety of others that can't be, or self, that can't be eliminated by a reasonable accommodation. Next slide, please. Most importantly for our discussion today, the ADA requires what they call the interactive process. And that means that if an employee has a disability and can't perform their, um, their essential job functions, you have to engage in a process where you basically sit down and talk to the employee about what, what's the barrier in the workplace that you're facing. Is there an accommodation that we as the employer can offer that will allow you to perform your job duties? And then you just have a back and forth with the employee. And a lot of this will be documented. You'll want to get um, documentation from the employee's doctor about the disability, the functional limitations, and what aspect of the workplace is a barrier and about what type of accommodation is needed. But it can't just be a yes or no. You have to sit down and actually engage and talk to the employee and try to find something that would work. And as I mentioned, the Virginia Human Rights Act has very similar requirements for smaller businesses. Next slide, please. So importantly, under the ADA, anyone who is currently engaging in the illegal use of drugs is not a qualified individual with a disability. Illegal drugs under the ADA, because it's a federal law, would be drugs that are illegal under federal law. So marijuana is an illegal drug. Someone who's currently engaging in the use of marijuana is not considered a qualified individual with a disability under the ADA, theoretically. I'm going to talk about some legal cases later in the presentation where courts went the other way on that, but that's what the law says. Um, they also say that um, the ADA also makes clear that if a person used to use drugs but has um, successfully been rehabilitated, then they are considered to be um, a qualified individual. And in fact, there can be protection. And you can be considered disabled because you have an addiction, but you're not currently using. Next slide, please. So there's no ADA protection or accommodation for the use of marijuana or other federal, federally illegal drugs. But the employees who are using marijuana or CBD for a medical reason may be entitled to an accommodation under the ADA for the underlying medical condition itself. And again, I'm going to go into some examples of that with some cases. Um, I already mentioned Virginia's law providing employment protection. But just to be aware, there are a lot of states that have laws that give some type of employment protection for marijuana use, and the state laws vary. I just told you about Virginia's, but if you have operations in other states, you'll want to look at those states' laws. And also, there, there, those states may impose some type of ADA-like obligations on the employers, but unlike the ADA, they may not have a prohibition against federal illegal drugs. So there's something you need to look at. Next slide, please. All right, now I'm going to talk briefly about um, safety regulations. Almost all businesses are subject to OSHA standards. If you um, have operations that are on, a, on federal territory or federal bases or on the waterfront, then those standards are enforced by, vote, by OSHA itself. But even if you are not on federal property, you're still subject to the same standards. It's just that they are then enforced by VOSH, which is the state agency. OSHA doesn't have any specific standard about drugs, but they do have the general duty clause, and that's the general duty that all employers have to provide a safe employment um, place for their employees, uh, a place that's free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or physical, serious physical harm to employees. 
You may recall that back, I believe it was 2015 or 2016, OSHA issued guidance that strongly discouraged post-accident drug testing. They took the position that um, requiring drug testing after an accident had the effects of discouraging people from reporting accidents. And that guidance caused a lot of confusion for businesses, and it was a a real, um, I think it was a real mistake on OSIS part. It was very, very confusing for businesses. Does that mean we can't do post-accident drug testing? And OSHA, OSHA's response at the time was, you can if it's possible that the employee's um, impaired state, if the employee was impaired, could have contributed to the accident. In reality, that was very difficult to administer. Well, if you aren't aware, because I've talked to some businesses that missed this, but in 2018, OSHA rescinded that guidance. They recognized that it was confusing, it was a mistake. So yes, you can do post-accident drug testing. What you can't do is use drug testing as a deterrent to reporting accidents. You know, you better not report that accident or else I'll make you do a drug test. I don't think any business does that anyway. I just can't imagine it, but um, that's that's what OSHA is saying now, that yes, you can do post-accident drug testing. And I think most companies do, and it's probably a good policy to have. Next slide, please. So some of you on this call are subject to IMSA, which is the mine equivalent of OSHA, Mine Safety and Health Administration. Um, IMSA does have a specific regulation that addresses this. They have a standard that prohibits intoxicating beverages and narcotics in or around mines. They can't be permitted or used in or around mines. Persons under the influence of alcohol or nar narcotics shall not be permitted on the job. Now, you're probably all aware marijuana is not a narcotic. But IMSHA has interpreted this regulation to apply equally to marijuana. Next slide, please. So I've just pulled two cases from the Mine Safety and Health Review Commission about marijuana that I think are kind of interesting for businesses in this field to understand how IMSHA looks at this. The first is from 2009. Um, this operator, there was a routine inspection and the IMSHA inspector uh, happened to notice behind an eleva elevator shaft, there was like this um, little cubby hole in the in the wall, and in that there was a hiding place, and someone had hidden some marijuana blunts. And the operator cited the operator. I'm sorry, the site the inspector cited the operator for violating the standard against narcotics on premises. And the um, Federal Mine Safety and Health Review Commission vacated that citation because there was no evidence that the operator actually permitted the marijuana on the property. There was no evidence that the operator knew it was there or permitted it or condoned it. So that was vacated. But then contrast that with this Weathers Crossing case um, from 2000. And this, I think, is also a good example of the rule of thumb that if there's a serious accident or a fatality, the federal investigator will find something to cite you for. It, they will find something. <laughs> they come out for that, they will find something. So this was a um, case of an employee who was killed. It's a workplace fatality. The employee had um, been working on a crusher and apparently tried to use a sledgehammer to dislodge something that was in the crusher, and the crusher spit the sledgehammer out right into his head. So he was transported to the hospital where he was pronounced dead, and they found in his pocket marijuana and a marijuana pipe. And also they tested him and the toxicology report revealed that he um, had cannabinoids in his system. The, he, the employer was cited for violating this IMSHA standard against narcotics on the premises. And it was undisputed that there was no evidence that the employer knew the employee was using marijuana or knew that there was marijuana on the property. But the commission nonetheless held that the employer was liable because the Mine Act imposes strict liability on mine operators for violation of the standards, irrespective of fault. So even though the operator had no idea and certainly did not um, condone or allow the employee to have marijuana, they were still liable for that violation. So it's just kind of an example. Um, as a general rule, you're gonna find that federal agencies don't really care what your state law is. If you're in, if you have employees with marijuana, they're going to find a violation. The first case was a, more of a surprise than anything. Next slide, please. Okay, DOT. A lot of you might have CDL drivers, and you might have drivers who are subject to DOT regulations um, and regulations under the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. 
there's a very clear um, regulation there that says no driver shall report for duty or remain on duty requiring the performance of safety sensitive functions when the driver uses any drug or substance identified as a schedule one drug. Very clear. No employer having actual knowledge that a driver has used a controlled substance shall permit the driver to perform or continue to perform a safety sensitive function. No employer having knowledge that a driver has tested positive or has adulterated or substituted a test specimen for controlled substances shall permit the driver to perform or continue to perform safety sensitive functions. So if you've got a CDL driver and they test positive, you've got a problem. You gotta take them off the road, even though it's legal in the state. Next slide, please. All right, now I'm gonna go through some cases to show you different ways that courts have looked at uh, marijuana. And most of these cases, I think all these cases are from states where marijuana is legal in one form or the other, either um, total legalization or medical um, marijuana. So the first case I'm gonna talk about is from California, which famously um, was one of the earlier states to legalize. And this is a case from 2012. The plaintiffs sued two cities in California that had closed their medical marijuana facilities. And they sued under ADA's Title II, which most people don't have much familiarity with. Title II applies to states and localities, and it prohibits states and localities from discriminating on the basis of disability and the provision of public services. So their argument was by closing the medical marijuana facilities in these cities, you have um, discriminated against the disabled and the provision of public services. And the court held um, marijuana use under a doctor's supervision in accordance with state law is not protected under the ADA. The ADA excludes illegal drug users from its definition of qualified individuals with a disability. The ADA does not protect individuals who claim to face discrimination on the basis of marijuana use. And it may be illegal under California law, but it's still illegal under the federal law. So that was the court's determination um, that there's no ADA protection for illegal drug use. Next slide, please. And this is a, an EEOC case from Michigan, a little more recent, 2015. Um, this employee was hired for a nursing job and she was required to take a drug test. She was a medical marijuana user, um, she had epilepsy, and that's legal to use marijuana for under Michigan law. And so she flunked the drug test and she was fired. She and the EEOC, and it's kind of rare for the EEOC to get involved in these cases, but it did here. They sued the employer alleging disability discrimination. And that's also kind of interesting because again, federal law doesn't protect marijuana usage, but here the EEOC intervened on the employee's behalf. That's a federal agency making an argument that you've discriminated against someone under the ADA for not allowing them to use medical marijuana. Very surprising position for the EEOC to take, given that it's illegal under federal law. The employer argued that they had fired her because she failed the drug test. And the court held discharge for illegal drug use is a permissible non-discriminatory reason for firing someone. So that would be fine. But the employer still didn't win because there was a factual dispute as to whether she was fired because of the marijuana use, which would not be illegal under federal law. It would not be a violation of the ADA or she was fired because she had epilepsy, which would be a violation of the ADA. So it was sent it back to the trial court to determine that issue. Next slide, please. Um, this case I think is very interesting for federal contractors. Is there any on the line? Um, Nostinger versus SSC Niantic Operating. It's a federal case from Connecticut. So Connecticut at the time allows, mar or Connecticut allows medical marijuana and it had an employment protection provision that barred employers from firing or refusing to hire someone for use of medical marijuana in compliance with Connecticut law. In the job interview, the employee disclosed that she had PSC, PTSD and that she took medical marijuana. And not surprisingly, after the job offer, she took the drug test and flunked it because of THC and the employer rescinded the job offer. The ADA allows the employer to prohibit the use of illegal drugs at the workplace, but it does not expressly allow an employer to prohibit drug use outside the workplace. That was the court's holding. Um, the court also held that the ADA allows the employer to hold an employee who engages in illegal drug use to the same qualification standards for employment that holds to others, even if there's unsatisfactory performance. Um, 
even if the unsatisfactory performance or behaviors related to the drug use. But drug use is not a qualification standard, because that was another argument the employer had made. The ADA does not protect marijuana users on the basis of their marijuana use, but Connecticut law does. So even though the employer um, couldn't be held liable under the ADA, they could be held liable under Connecticut law. Next slide. And where the federal contractor aspect came into play is the employer raised as a defense, hey, we're a federal contractor, we're subject to the Drug-Free Workplace Act, and that requires us to fire people who test positive for marijuana. And the court said, no, it doesn't. <laughs> the Drug-Free Workplace Act doesn't even require drug testing. It doesn't prohibit federal contractors from employing someone who uses illegal drugs outside the workplace, much less someone who uses medical marijuana in accordance with the state law. Um, that the defendant has chosen to utilize a zero tolerance drug testing policy in order to maintain a drug free work environment does not mean that this policy was actually required by federal law or required to obtain federal funding. So I think that's going to be um, an interesting case to see if that's applied elsewhere, that logic that being a federal contractor doesn't mean you can fire someone for using drugs in the workplace. Next slide, please. Um, interesting case from Arizona just two years ago. Arizona has a Medical Marijuana Act and it prohibits employment discrimination based on a registered qualified patient's positive drug test for marijuana unless the employee used, possessed, or was impaired by marijuana at work. The employee was a, um, a registered medical marijuana user in Arizona and she claimed that she smoked medical marijuana as a sleep aid and for chronic pain because of her arthritis. Um, she testified that she never brought it to work and she was never impaired during work hours. There was an accident and it was, it was Walmart and basically um, some items stacked on a shelf above her um, fell. They weren't stacked properly and they fell and she was hurt. And they did post-accident drug testing and she tested positive for marijuana metabolites at a quantitative value of greater than 1,000 nanograms per milliliter. And the employer determined that that test result indicated that she was impaired during her shift and they terminated her employment for a violation of the drug policy. The employee filed suit alleging that it was a violation of the Arizona law and the court held that the employer is going to have to present expert witness testimony as to whether that amount of marijuana metabolites indicates impairment. So this goes to that issue I was talking about earlier about the lack of a precise line for when someone's impaired when it comes to marijuana. There is no clear law or no clear science really on whether that amount of marijuana metabolites necessarily indicates impairment. So they would have to go back and have expert testimony on that issue. Next slide, please. Colorado, um, I found this very interesting, but there's really no employment prote protection for marijuana use in Colorado. They, um, this is a case from 2015, at the time medical marijuana was legal, and Colorado also has a, a law that makes it unfair and discriminatory labor practice to discharge an employee based on the employee's lawful outside of work activities. So, so this plaintiff claimed that he was fired for using medical marijuana at home during non-work time, and that such use is lawful and therefore protected by Colorado law. And the court said, no, it's still illegal under federal law. So you can be fired for that. Um, you know, not, not the result you would expect in Colorado, but that's the law. And I've talked to some practitioners, some employment law attorneys out in Colorado, and they said, yeah, out there it's pretty clear you can fire someone for marijuana. Next slide, please. Massachusetts, another case um, from 2017. They had a law that decriminalized medical marijuana, but it didn't provide any employment protection. The employee uh, was taking medical marijuana for Crohn's disease, and she took a job offer that was contingent on passing a drug test. She was upfront. She told the new employer, hey, I'm a medical marijuana user. I'm going to test positive. And the supervisor said, no problem. Don't worry about it. But she failed the drug test and was fired immediately. <laughs> um, the employer argued that it was just following federal law that prohibits marijuana. And the court held, but because she had a disability, you had to accommodate her under Massachusetts law, and you had a duty to engage in the interactive process to determine if there was a reasonable accommodation that would help her perform her job. 
The court also implied that an employer should determine whether a medical marijuana user could treat his or her medical condition with a different medicine instead of medical marijuana. So that goes back to that obligation for a reasonable accommodation that I mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. Um, this is probably my favorite decision. This is from Rhode Island. And I always love it when judges uh, appear to be having fun. And this judge appeared to really, really enjoy writing this opinion. It's um, laced with, with marijuana jokes, um, lots of Beatles references, clearly a huge Beatles fan. He begins the court opinion um, with a quote from the Beatles. You don't see that very often. So he begins the opinion with, I get high with a little help from my friends. And he makes um, jokes in here like, to adequately, adequately perform its task, this court must wade into the weeds of the law of private rights of action, federal preemption, and statutory interpretation. Hopefully, it will not write out of key or analyze out of tune. Um, this is a case in which the employer had rejected a job applicant who was a registered med mer medical marijuana user based on a pre-employment drug test. Rhode Island law prohibits employment discrimination on the basis of being a medical marijuana cardholder. And the employer argued that there's federal preemption here. We have um, federal law, which makes clear that marijuana is illegal. Um, we have the ADA, which makes clear that there's no protection for illegal drug use. So we have federal preemption and court issues to follow federal law instead of state law. That's, um, it's prime here. It, it, has, um, it, it trumps the state law. And the court said, well, not exactly. So Congress, Federal law may, against, may be against marijuana, but Congress and the federal government, they're not really enforcing that right now. Congress has passed spending amendments that prevent the funds being appropriated, um, that are appropriate to DOJ to be used to prevent states from implementing their own laws that authorize medical marijuana. So the court was saying it may be illegal under federal law, but the feds aren't really enforcing it in states like Rhode Island. So I don't see any need to say that federal law preempts state law here. A very surprising result. And the um, holding was that the employer had illegally discriminated against the plaintiff by failing to accommodate her medical marijuana use. Next slide, please. Okay, in this case, this probably um, it may uh, touch a nerve with um, people in the construction industry, but this is a New Jersey case from just a couple of years ago. New Jersey has a medical marijuana act that decriminalized medical marijuana, and the plaintiff in this case was a forklift operator, and he was required to take a post-accident drug test. And he told the employer up front, I'm not going to pass because I take several medically prescribed drugs, including medical marijuana. Um, the employer put him on an indefinite suspension and explained he can't work again until you test negative for marijuana. So he filed a suit claiming disability discrimination under New Jersey's dis disability law, and he argued that he could perform the job and he should not be required to take a test for marijuana. And the court held that New Jersey law does not require private employers to waive drug tests for users of medical marijuana. Marijuana is still illegal under federal law. So the employer won. Next slide, please. Well, the New Jersey legislature did not like that. And the following year, they passed a law in response to that case, um, specifically to undo the effect of that decision. It's basically the legislature overruling the judge. So they passed a law the following year that extended workplace protections to employees and healthcare practitioners engaging in activities authorized by New Jersey's Compassionate Use Medical Cannabis Act. The law prohibits employers from taking any adverse employment action against a medical marijuana user based solely on the employee's status as a registrant under the act. Um, if the person has a valid prescription, and again, the word prescription it really should be put in quotes, it really is a certification for marijuana or CBD, et cetera, then the employer cannot discriminate against the employee for use of those substances. After a positive drug test, the employer must allow the employee or applicant to present a legitimate medical explanation for the positive test results. All right, so next slide, please. So just some takeaway um, tips for employers' best practices as we um, wade into this new world of legalized marijuana. Um, and now's the time to start revising your policies and your handbook and, and your job descriptions to do what you can to put yourself in a good position to take action when you have employees who are impaired. First, identify your safety-sensitive jobs. Um, 
in the construction industry, you've got a lot of them, but certainly your bookkeepers are not safe, safety sensitive. So identify those jobs that are safety sensitive and look at the job description, stress the safety sensitive tasks in the job description, make it clear this is a safety sensitive position. Take a look at your drug policy. Um, make sure you're addressing this issue. Drug use, impairment, and possession in the workplace should be prohibited. And lay out what the consequences are, that you can be disciplined or terminated at the employer's discretion. If you do testing, um, which again, I think most businesses do, and if you don't, I would recommend you consider doing that. If you do drug testing, um, you should have written policy about that too, to be part of your drug policy. Um, these are the times when I most often see employers do drug testing, pre-employment, reasonable suspicion, random, and post-accident. You want to define what does reasonable suspicion mean? And you should have a policy that when a supervisor or a manager um, tags someone to be tested based on reasonable suspicion, there should be some real good documentation about what they observed. Was it a smell? Was it the person's behavior? Was it the person's look? Get as many witnesses as you can to write written statements about what exactly they saw that led them to believe that this person was impaired. And that's going to be really important, especially with the inaccuracy of THC um, analysis, as we've discussed earlier. You also want to, um, in your policy, address the limited employment protection under Virginia law for medical cannabis oils. I talked about earlier, go ahead and write that in. You want to communicate the policy to employees, pass it out, make it part of the handbook, have them sign receipt for it. Next slide, please. And then if the person does test positive for THC, don't just jump to termination. Um, you want to proceed cautiously. There are going to be a number of factors that you're going to have to anal analyze. Why was the person tested? Was it a reasonable suspicion? If so, did you document that reasonable suspicion? Can you show that the person was impaired? You know, ideally you'd have um, witnesses who could say this person looked impaired and it described why they thought the person was impaired with details. And But you're gonna need to find out why does the person have THC in his system? Ask him. Um, if the person says it's because he's got some medical condition, ask if he has a written certification under Virginia law, and then you need to get a copy of it. And you're going to need to analyze whether that's valid and whether that entitles him to protection under the new Virginia law, if you, especially if you can't prove impairment. And again, if he's impaired, he's not protected, but proving impairment can be very challenging. Um, if he's using it to treat a disability, you might need to do some analysis on whether he's entitled to an accommodation for the disability. He probably wouldn't be entitled to an accommodation for the marijuana usage, but he might be entitled to an accommodation for the disability itself, and that's something you're going to need to look into. And all this is going to depend on what type of work this employee does. Is he in a safety-sensitive position? Is he working on a federal contract or on a federal job site? Is he a CDL driver? Is he a mine worker? Are you subject to IMSA regulations? Um, are you a defense industrial-based sector business? Um, and if so, does the test show the amount of THC? Because as I mentioned, the Virginia law doesn't provide employment protection if the person's working for a defense industrial-based sector um, business and if the person's THC levels are above certain um, numbers, which I talked about on an earlier slide. All this is very complicated. Uh, I do recommend that you put the person on administrative leave and consult with legal counsel to make sure you're not making any missteps in this area. Next slide, please. So just as a reminder, this presentation has been recorded. You're going to get a copy of the slides in the presentation. Um, I'm going to turn to questions now. So if you haven't already, you have an opportunity still to enter some questions. Um, as I said, look for the little bubble at the top of the screen with the uh, question mark. Okay, first question, can we not ask the question about any crimes other than minor traffic violations? I don't think that's a good question to have um, in your employment uh, paperwork or in your application or in interviews, a general question like that. You can have a question like that, but I would amend it with a um, statement that you do not need to disclose any convictions, charges, or arrests for simple possession of marijuana. So if you're going to have that question, have that caveat so people know they don't have to disclose that information. Uh, next question, on a mine site, if there is an accident that warrants IMSA investigation, 
serious injury or fatality where a person involved in the accident tests positive for marijuana, what is the exposure for the mine operator? There's a good chance that you will be cited. And that goes to that weather crushing case that I discussed, where even though the operator had no knowledge of the marijuana use, um, they were still held liable for the citation. Next question, basically all job sites and mining are safety sensitive. Can we just say this? Um, yes, but think about it. You still have some employees who aren't in safety sensitive positions. They're office workers, but the people who are actually working in the mine, yeah, that's probably all going to be safety sensitive. And you can say that, but, you know, again, you're not going to have, your office workers aren't going to be safety sensitive. Is there any accurate and reliable method for determining marijuana impairment? So to my knowledge, um, there isn't any readily available test in the states that does do that. I've heard that in some Nordic country, I want to say it was Sweden, they're pioneering some test that would work almost like a breathalyzer where they'd be able to test the saliva in your mouth to see if you're impaired from marijuana, but I, that's not available here yet. And I'm not even sure if that's been shown to be effective. So to my knowledge, there's no real accurate or reliable method for determining medical or for determining marijuana impairment currently in the state. It's going to depend on what the toxicology report shows in terms of how much THC is in the person's system. You're going to have to have expert witnesses to testify as to whether that level of THC would equate to impairment in this individual. But more importantly and easier to come by is witness testimony. Um, which is why, again, I stress that it's really important to have the supervisor or the manager or any other witness take written notes about what exactly they saw that made them think that this person was impaired. He reeked of marijuana. He was um, dazed and confused. His eyes were glassy and bloodshot. Anything else that they observed that made you think this person was impaired, you want to write all that down and have that as evidence. And that's going to really carry the day for you. So it doesn't look like we have any more questions. Um, is there, are there any more slides? Is there a final slide? All right, that's it. So thank you. Um, thanks, Gordon. Did you want to say something else? And just really well, I appreciate you for taking the time. Really informative uh, presentation. You, you put a lot of content in here uh, within the the, the, four, the hour that we, we had here. So definitely have to go back and re-review it. And you got your contact information here. So if you have an individual question, please uh, feel free to shoot back a, a question or a call and at, at the number here on, on the site and uh, go forward from there. So and thank you very much. Greatly appreciate your time today. Thank you. Bye, everybody.